This morning, I want to talk to you about what does good look like for continuity of care and how on earth does that relate to patient safety? At the moment, we live in broken times and we really feel the need for hope. And I feel that that means we need continuity of carer now more than ever, because if you think about the acronym HOPE, H means we are able through continuity of carer to give holistic care to every family and make sure that every family counts. We can improve outcomes and make sure that mums and babies are healthier through giving the best possible care. Our care can be precise and targeted so that the right woman gets the right care at the right place by the right person. And therefore, we reduce adverse outcomes and um, experience the E in hope means that women get better care, families get better care and midwives have a better experience caring for these families. So we have the perfect uh, set of ingredients here to think about how we can improve the maternity services, make them safer, improve outcome and make working lives of midwives uh, in particular uh, better. So what do we need to do? Well, the journey isn't straightforward. Uh, we've been talking about this for some time, uh, but transformation is a journey that can be undertaken and it will result in improved outcomes. So it might feel like while we're going through this period of transformation, like you're going along a road and the road just experiences an enormous earthquake and it's all tipped upside down, but that's because if we're really, truly trying to do transformation as opposed to tinkering around the edges of a current service, you do need to think about everything in a very different way. And what we want to do is go from being that caterpillar into being that beautiful service and being far more functional and far more effective than we've ever been before. When we think about change, we need to think about uh, making improvements that stick. There's no point in us changing something and then next week the government changes or the funding stream changes or something else changes and it all falls down and all the effort we've put into it uh, is gone. What we're looking at doing here is talking about how we improve a service in a way that remains changed for the better. And the way we do that, according to Cotter, who's the great change guru that you'll have all heard of, is that we need to institutionalise the change. Now, I'm not going to talk about change management on this video, but you do need to understand this concept. This is not about putting three teams in place for an enormous service. This is about reorganising your entire maternity service to work in a different sort of way. And that means all of us that are involved in the service need to think about service delivery in a different way. It's not about the physical care that somebody gets. Women will still need their blood pressure taking and uh, urine monitoring and all the things that you'd expect to happen. This is about how services are delivered. That is the thing that then brings around the continuity of care that we're, we're looking for. Our context for those of you who are young and don't remember is that we've talked about providing continuity of care for 27 years or thereabouts in the first document was in 1993, right the way through to 2016. And we've always talked about the key elements that improve outcomes and lead to better outcomes is by providing choice, individualized care, continuity of care and access to care. These are the themes that run throughout all these documents and it's what we are trying to achieve now and actually are well positioned to get to. Why is it important if we're going to go on this journey and if we're going to go for, to the trouble of creating a, a transformed maternity service, we need to know why we are doing it. The most important reason is that we're going to improve maternal mortality and morbidity. The Cochrane Review sets it out. It's the best way of um, looking at all the evidence together and saying what is the biggest thing that's going to make a difference to everybody? And the answer is continuity of carer. It leads to reduced interventions, um, as well as improving morbidity and mortality, um, reduced instrumental deliveries, episiotomies. And then there's other softer things you could say, like reduced length of stay, improved mental well-being, improved satisfaction for women and midwives. It has a positive epigenetic effect. That means that when the mother and baby diet are healthy during pregnancy, bearing in mind things like cardiac disease have their origins in the uterus, it means that person, when it grows up, won't drop dead of a heart attack when it's age, when that person is age 60. So what we're doing within maternity services is not just changing an immediate outcome for that few months while that woman is pregnant and giving birth, but we're changing 
health outcomes of the nation. And that is so important to understand when we think about how we deliver our services. It also feeds into um, elements like breastfeeding and improves child health and well-being. Um, therefore, it was cost effective. And other pieces of evidence that come into this story are things like the work that Anthony Costello did in the Indian subcontinent, looking at um, people working in a relational uh, way to improve their outcomes, or Barker, who looked at GPs that provided continuity of care and saw improved mortality. And finally, looking at workforce modelling, evidence suggests it's best for midwives. Um, as you can see on this side of the screen is the actual Cochrane Review evidence, if you want to read it or you can Google it. Um, and what Jane Sandal said, who's the main author from the Cochrane Review and has done an awful lot of research, into this field is if continuity of care was a drug, it would be unethical not to provide it. And I think that is the key thing. As we think about what we're doing, we need to understand the impact of what it is that we're doing. And that is set out here, I hope, very clearly. So where do we want to be? Our default position should be that all pregnant women in England are cared for within a continuity of care team. We do recognise that some women are out of area or are being uh, travelling in from other cities, even for tertiary referral or fetal medicine. Um, and we need to make provision for those people. But for the majority of the, our women, we can care for them within a continuity of care team. So what does that look like? Well, it's maternity care that's delivered by midwives being organised into teams of less than eight head count, so eight or less. Each midwife aims to provide antenatal, intrapartum and postnatal care to each of her women. But of course, they have annual leave, protected days off, and they take it in turns to be available for out of hours care. So that does mean that you're not on call all the time. Probably you're on call once a week and probably in a month you will be present for three births because that's the maths. It's very obvious if you're looking after 36 women, that's three babies a month. So it's it's nothing to be worried about. Um, you usually book slightly more than you plan to birth because if you don't do that, you won't manage your flow and you won't manage uh, your input and output once you get your system up and running in the full way. But it is important to note that only where there are defined teams looking after women in this way, can you say that a woman has been placed on a continuity of care pathway. The other element of a continuity of care pathway is that each team has a link named obstetrician who works as part of the team. And the team has a strong ethos allowing for fresh eyes. That means that you do reflection and audit and discussion together on a regular basis. And the last thing to say is that the whole maternity service is involved in continuity. This is not about those teams over there and then here's the core building that does core stuff. This is about the entire service organizing themselves into the position where they can be continuity carer. And this is really important. So what are the key elements of good? Well, the first one is that midwives are rooted in a team. And that means in order to be successful, autonomous, flexible teams are the most effective. And the way you organise these teams is into mixed risk geographical uh, places, each having its named obstetrician. That is for the majority of women the way to do it. And then each team monitors its own work. This is based on Cochrane. So we're only modelling what Cochrane has already described. And that within the context of care, we make sure that each woman has her personalised care and support plan, which is updated at every visit. That is a, what we've always called in the past a care plan. But the idea is that we make sure that each woman has something that is personal to her and is appropriate for her and is written up within the context of doing a regular risk assessment. So at the moment, you're low risk. What's going to happen to you? Well, we'll probably see you seven to ten times and you'll be able to give birth in the birth centre or for an obstetric unit, if you prefer, or at home. But you've made that plan with the woman and with any other professionals that are involved in her care. In order to do this, you have to make sure if you're a midwifery leader in particular that your staffing establishment is right. And so we strongly recommend that you do birth rate plus and that gives you a traditional modelling baseline. But then as you move forward, 
you plan to staff the women and not the building because that is the thing that helps us to manage the ebbs and flows as as we do the work and if we do this we will address the Ockenden uh, recommendations where one of the most outstanding issues uh, raised was around organizational culture and work experience because in working in this way means that you have a better method of communication between you and your colleagues and the multidisciplinary team and your work experience improves. It also ensures that there's continuous care planning and risk assessment. This is the very best way of achieving that. And it also facilitates uh, multidisciplinary team working. So where does that fit with uh, CNST, which is the reporting mechanism they have with, within maternity services? Well, the national ambition, as I've already said, is that all women benefit from continuity of carer. What we want to see is that Black, Asian and mixed race women are targeted first for the reasons that I've already said, and also women living in the lowest decile of deprivation, because in these groups have the worst outcomes physically, and therefore we want to make the quickest changes for them to level the playing field, so to speak. And each team in this context will have a linked obstetrician. The priority and requirement though, you should be thinking about if you're thinking about doing this now maybe you haven't even started your journey yet is that you need to set a solid foundation and that means that you make a plan you make a plan to provide continuity of care as a, as described and then you need to share that plan because if you've got a plan and it's in your head nobody will ever know about it and you won't follow it up it's going to have to need accountability with your with your book trust your trust board your staff your lms and uh, and it might need to change as things go on because all of us, as I said, are involved in continuity of carer. So absolutely, your patient safety lead needs to see the plan and you need a process in place that measures the progress. And you need to make sure that you've got safe staffing in place as you roll out the plan. And in a few slides time, I'm going to show you a little example of how you make the plan. If you do this, you'll achieve safety action nine, which at this point talks about 35% continuity of care. But really, if you're wise, you'll go for how many women you can achieve, which hopefully is 100%. Or if it's less than that, you know who is not going to be in your bag to start with. And then the other part is uh, it means you'll achieve safety action two, which is a method of monitoring what you're doing. So how do we do this? Well, you need good planning, as I've just described in the previous slide you want to get to success which is that the default position is that most women have continuity of carer you need to execute it so the first thing you absolutely have to have in place is a really good comms plan everybody needs to know that you're doing this if you're not trying it there's nothing no pilot no, nothing like that going on you've got a plan the first few teams will roll out you'll stop you'll review and then the next few teams will go out until you have the right number of teams for all your women living in your area and that's the communication that needs to go out. Everybody needs to know what their part in is it in it is. So, for example, are they going to be in the core? Are they a specialist midwife? Are they continuity midwife? Are they the linked obstetrician? So on and so forth. Everybody needs to know what's happening. And that means the comms are absolute vital. Second thing is you need to have team preparation. Team needs to know how they're going to function together. They've got methods of communication. They're going to have team meetings, all those things. Individual midwives need to assess where they're at, their own personal training needs analysis, if you like. So if I've been a community midwife for many years, I might need to spend some time in, in the hospital learning what's where within the context of the building. Or if I'm a delivery suite midwife, I might want to go and spend some time with the community midwife learning about the area that I'm going to work in. But each midwife and each team will have their own learning needs. And it's important that they're identified before you roll out the team. Each trust will need its own standard operating policy. Who's going to call who, het, when, so there's no confusion. A state, where are the teams going to be based? Equipment has to be all sorted out. It's not rocket science, but you need to include that in your planning process. And finally, how are you going to pay people that it remains equitable? And within the toolkit, and the uh, website is going to come up at the end, you can click on there and you can get... Um, an example to look at or if it's not there you can um, contact me directly for that. Thinking about the team it's really important to understand that all research looking into healthcare workforce says 
that where workforces work in teams and the teams function well, there is improved outcomes, reduced medical um, errors, increased patient safety, improved worker outcomes, reduced stress. You can look at these all for yourself uh, later, but it's important to understand that one of the reasons why team is so important is not just for the women and their outcomes, it's also better for the workforce. <clears throat> now, teams normally tell me, and midwives very frequently tell me how much they love working in continuity of care teams. The only times I've ever come across situations where it hasn't worked is where teams have fallen out. That's why I refer to the fact that before you start your teams, you need to give those teams time to think about how they're going to work together. And there are various things they need to think about. They need some tools about managing conflict between them, but they also need to have some tools about thinking about how they function as a team. That means learning to trust each other, learning to have disagreements, and then how you mitigate them, how you work toward the goals together. So having a staffing plan is your first step because it is the most complex part of making a plan, I guess. So within the staffing tool where the website is at the, at the end of this slide deck, you can click on there. You, there's um, a little slidey bar that helps you think about uh, how many teams and, and, and all that. And there's also this Excel spreadsheet in there for you to wipe clean and put your own data in. But essentially, how you work out how you're going to deliver continuity of care is as follows. You have to start out with your starting position. That means you need to know where your midwives are places i.e wards delivery suite community and so on and so forth you need to list those places and you need to list how you staffed those places and it should add up if you if you're doing this right to all your staff that you have so your funded establishment or your birth rate plus recommendation which should be roughly the same and so in this example it's 218.45 and then you work out how you're going to move forward. Now, wave one of your plan should be between one and three teams. So you get the teams in place and you can test how it's working. You can make sure that your referral system works and your SOP works and everything is working properly. So you have that first wave done and then you wait a month or two. So you tested it all. And then you go into wave two, three, four, five, however you want to do it. There's no prescribed way. But what we recommend is that once you've got wave one in place, you do the rest of the waves at pace. So you get you get it done because there's no advantage in waiting once you know that your system is working. So wave one, three teams, seven midwives, you reorganize your midwives. And hey, presto, you find out that it's still 218 midwives in post, in, in, in post at the end of that first iteration, which gives this trust 18% uh, placed on the pathway and 17% done. And you can see that they start off up here with, with, with my cursor where it tells you um, 4,300 women are delivered. And so once you uh, subtract the women that have been cared for in the continuity of care team, you have to think about these are the women left behind. And then this group here is what's going to be in the intrapartum area. So you're, you're, you've always got an eye on what you're looking at and what, who you're caring for and who's been cared for where. And you move through. So by the time you get to wave five, you've got 17 teams in place with 119 midwives. You've only got 120 women not receiving intrapartum care from a continuity model because they're the out of area women. And therefore, you have a core. So you always have a still a, um, a band seven labelled um, coordinator. And you have some band sixes part of the core. And each trust will have a different number. So just because this example says four and two doesn't mean that your trust has to have it like that. Each trust will be a different number. Um, and at the end of this reorganisation, you still have 217.58. But actually, you'd probably stick with the 218 in real life you have to calibrate it according to what's appropriate for you but this just demonstrates to you how it's possible to do this so where does the obstetrician fit in the team there, these are the key elements that you need to bear in mind each team needs to have a linked obstetrician and that person needs to be named that's really important this is not about a theoretical link this is about a real person who plays a real part in the team 
and they're not left out, they're firmly part of the team is what I've written here. And that's just really important to understand. They don't have to come maybe to every single team meeting, but on, on a monthly basis, they should be at the team reviewing the work that the team is doing and that cohort of women together, because this is about um, a multidisciplinary team that, that talks to each other. They'll need to have an agreed method of communication and Southend has got an excellent system set up where they talk by WhatsApp and they have been doing this for several months now and it works really, really well. And if you do this, you'll have a really smooth referral process that's not a, oh no, this woman has coughed, I don't know what to do, I'll send her into the clinic and you never see that woman again. This is about a real, um, thought through referral process where Mrs. Whoever she is, is sitting in front of you. There's an issue comes up. You can talk to your um, linked obstetrician and you discuss the referral and you decide where that person needs to go and how you're going to do it. Is it going to be a virtual conversation? Is it the midwife and the woman going to the clinic together to see someone specific? Or is it something that the midwife can execute on, under the direction of the the linked obstetrician, it becomes much more personalised and much more linked to that individual's need. Now, just because the obstetrician is linked to that team, it doesn't mean that that obstetrician has to provide care to each of those women. It only is um, it, so that so the main goal of the linked obstetrician is that that person is in an advisory relationship when women need obstetric input but they may pick up some of the women from that team and the team can decide how all of that works in detail between themselves. Um, but all the obstetricians in the maternity services should be allocated to a team or several teams. So for example, if you have 10 teams in your service and you have five obstetricians, each of those obstetricians would work with two teams each, but they don't necessarily have to provide care to all those women even the high risk ones, because you also ought to have in place your cut, cross cutting obstetric care. So, for example, Mrs. Bloggs with epilepsy will be cared for by the person who's got an interest and special expertise in epilepsy, for example. Um, we strongly recommend that you consider setting up maternal medicine teams that work in exactly the same way as I've described. Pick up women from booking so they can receive all elements of care. And maybe there is a band seven specialist midwives that feed into that. We also want our continuity of care teams to link in with maternal medicine networks. And this is sort of something that's coming forward now. So look out for object uh, updates on this. And there is a what we want and what we think is the right thing within all of this is that we're using a collegiate approach. We're a group of people all trying to do the same thing for women. Some of the, the details within this of how a team works is that you review your compliments, your complaints, and you support each other through adverse events. So is it doable in a time of crisis? I go back to the first slide and say it's more necessary now than at ever any time before. And yes, it is doable. We're not asking anybody to do anything that's more difficult. We're asking somebody to do something that's actually easier when you unpack it. Um, there are resources available to you. So here is the link for the um, Continuity of Carer Toolkit, for example, that's got many of these tools in it. If you're a leader, you have to think about using complex leadership. Think about, well, we're in this difficult situation here. How do we use this difficult situation to get to where we want to go to? We should be thinking about using our uh, PMAs, um, our maternity voices partners, and absolutely using birth rate plus the benchmarking the traditional uh, number of midwives needed within the context of our service. So we have many competing calls on our time and energy, but let's not make the same mistakes over and over again, which is what we've done in the last 27 years as we keep trying to make teams work and make continuity of carer work within the confines of the existing model. We have to take those jigsaw pieces and throw them apart. All the pieces are relevant. All the things that we're asked to do are important. However, what we've done is we've piled all these things onto this cart horse here. We said, well, we're trying to do continuity of care. We're trying to save babies' lives. We're trying to get CNST. We're doing all these things, but we haven't understood that we need a mechanism to pull everything forward. And actually, if we get continuity of care right, you will find in your services 
that all these other asks that are described here on these jigsaw pieces or in these boxes here will come together and continuity of care will be the conduit that pulls you forward and helps you get the service safe and personalised. So, pregnancy gives us a window of opportunity. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. If we want to improve the health of our nation, if we want to improve the health of women and babies, we have to take this opportunity to do things. So our evidence tells us that where there is good antenatal care in place, we contribute to good physical well-being. And those are some um, papers that you could look at for that, as well as the ones I cited before. But likewise, it gives us an opportunity to impact maternal mental well-being. And again, there's lots of evidence that says when a woman is not depressed, her child does well at school and flourishes and goes on and succeeds in life. And the adverse is also true. Where women are depressed, children have what's called low adaptive functioning and they don't do as well at school. It's not the child's fault, but it's circumstantial circumstances which we can help to mitigate and make people healthier so i'm here to help you can contact me in in these ways if you want to you can contact uh, patient safety learning or there are other ways you can uh, get in touch but look, look forward to hearing from you to see how we can help you roll out your teams thank you